The following program contains incessant calls to battle with the unsavory. If you suffer from squeaky clean handedness, Randall might not be right for you. Check with your local Pharisee. Standing for truth in the four corners of America. Fighting for justice on the frontiers of the culture wars. And turning resistance into an art form. Randall Terry. Hello, friend. What do President Obama, Pope Francis, Ted Cruz, and Miley Cyrus all have in common? Well, I'm fixing to tell you. Don't go away. It's time now for Down Home with Granny Jihad. A lot of grappa. Boys and girls, listen. Muhammad was asked, what is the best deed? He replied, to believe in Allah and his apostle Muhammad. The questioner then asked, what is the next best in goodness? He replied, to participate in jihad, religious fighting in Allah's cause. Welcome to the show, friend. We are broadcasting to you from Memphis, from our temporary studio. We will be here while our son, Michael Winston, is being, for, is being treated for cancer at St. Jude Children's Research Hospital. We ask you for prayers for his full recovery, please. I hope that you're having a good Advent season. I hope that you have time to meditate on and ponder the coming of Christ into this world. This is absolutely my favorite time of year. Uh, canonically, it, it, as far as our Christian faith is concerned, the birth, the life, the death, burial, and resurrection of our Lord Jesus Christ is part and parcel to the whole of our faith. It just, Christmas is a delight. Easter is, of course, what gives us hope for the conquering of the grave. And uh, I just hope that you're having a blessed time. I really do. I want to talk to you about a whole bunch of things today that are really important. Let's start with this story, uh, the, the poll that came out. Rasmussen did a poll and they just asked people, who do you think the most influential person in the world is? A very, very simple, very straight up question. And at the top of the list was Pope Francis, 23%. I mean, look at the list, you see it there. You've got Barack Obama trailing only by two points. But here's a big surprise, Ted Cruz? at 11%? Whoa, that's a good year for Ted Cruz. Then, one of our favorite characters, Edward Snowden, he's at 8%. The Russian Vladimir Putin, he's at 4%. And then John Boehner and Chris Christie are barely one point ahead of Miley Cyrus and Kate Middleton. It's really interesting that Miley Cyrus beat out Angela Merkel, Malala Yousafzai, I, I don't wanna say her name wrong, Yousafzai, um, she, in case you forgot, is the young girl, the Pakistani girl who has been writing that girls should be educated in Muslim countries. There was an attempt on her life and there is still a standing death threat against her from the followers of the peaceful religion of Islam. Um, and then, of course, of course, Kathleen Sebelius. This list actually made me feel good and very nervous at the same time. Let's talk about the good. The fact that you had the Pope first and Ted Cruz third, well, that says that at least of the people that they polled, it was a, it was a poll of a thousand adults, that people are paying attention. That's really something. I, I, I live in a state of great sadness over the state of the average American, all right? We're so completely absorbed in bread and circuses that I'm afraid for our country. I really am. I'm afraid for our children. But to see Pope Francis as number one and Ted Cruz, a freshman senator from Texas who rocketed into notoriety because of his stand against Obamacare and his filibuster that really wasn't maybe a filibuster, that's really something. And it also shows 
the, the influence of the Tea Party in the general populace. Now think about it. A thousand people were, po were polled. 23% of them said the Pope. 11% of them said Ted Cruz. That's 34%. That's one third of the people that were polled not only have their eye on the ball, but they picked someone good. That says that there are people out there who want change, who want good leaders. Now, I'll tell you what's frightening about this is that Miley Cyrus is on this list. That actually terrifies me. In case you don't know, uh, Miley Cyrus is the latest in a string of, of really bad examples for young people, especially young women. I mean, there was a day when everyone thought Madonna was horrible, wretched. You know, you thought Madonna was bad. And then you thought, well, no, Britney Spears, she's really bad. And then you know, Lady Gaga, she's really, really bad. Well, now we've got Miley Cyrus. This, this young woman is off the charts. Just a sad, lost soul. But what's scary is that 2% of the people polled said that she's the most influential person on the planet. Well, who's she influencing? young girls, young women. Keep your child away from Miley Cyrus and maybe keep your kids away from the Disney house. I mean, if you think about how many kids came up through the ranks of Disney and then gone off into really bad things. Mickey Mouse, I like. Some of these other people, I'm not so sure. Miley Cyrus being on this list, that's scary. What's good is that only 2% of the people thought it, but the, numbers of, the number of kids that she's influencing right now, God have mercy on us. I'll be right back. My wife and I for five years have been grinding our own wheat and baking our own bread from scratch. Within two hours, you can have fresh wheat in your hand and then piping hot bread come out of the oven. The most nutritious and delicious bread you will ever have. And we do it for under a dollar a loaf. Call Paula's Bread and find out about this grain mill and the mixer and how it can save you money and change your life. It is better to have an ambitious plan than none at all. Sir Winston Churchill. All right, so we've got a bad president and we've got bad money and we've got Bitcoins. Now, I just, I have to talk about Bitcoins for just a minute. If you haven't heard about them, you will, all right? My simple advice is if you've got money to gamble, just to pour right down the drain, go ahead and buy a couple. Why not? If you don't, don't do it because it is a bubble that is going to burst. I read a story last night from Forbes. People aren't really even sure who created this. It's a cyber currency, okay? I'm not kidding. Backed by the full faith and credit of cyberspace. And it was a month ago, a Bitcoin was worth $400. Today, a Bitcoin is worth over $800. And just a couple of years ago, when the Bitcoin was created, it was like, a few cents, 30 some odd cents, then it jumped up to $2, then it jumped up to $32, then it jumped back down to $2, and now it's at 800. So you've got a bubble. People are starting to throw money in it. There's a very limited amount. One source that I read said that there are 11 million Bitcoins that have been produced, but they're all made in cyberspace. What are they gonna, I mean, how can you have counterfeit Bitcoins? Huh? Maybe somebody is gonna figure out a way to do a counterfeit Bitcoin. Oh no, wait, they already are. There are people that are now minting and they're calling them bitcoins. One of them has a piece of paper inside of it in the middle and you can break it and have partial bitcoins. What's a bitcoin? A bitcoin is a, is a form of currency. If, I'm, I'm sorry, I didn't make that clear. If you, if, that was really bad television, by the way. There was a part of the teleprompter at the beginning that I did not recognize. I didn't see it. A bitcoin is a fiat currency. My wife and I were talking last night about it and what's funny is that we are so accustomed to using plastic. You know what I'm thinking about it. 
wh what is this card? What, what, does, what does this card mean? Why can I walk up to a machine and put this card in it and get money or go and slash it and buy food or buy gas? It's not cash. It represents fiat money somewhere. So a Bitcoin is the next logical thing. It's fiat money. It's just made up. There's not really money. And, and it's going wild with its value, with inflation. Now, I'll, I'll leave this. I'll come back to it another day. But just remember, think of, say, the Confederate dollar. There have been fiat currencies in the past that have come and gone pretty quick. And I have a feeling that there's going to be some people who end up going to jail over this. I mean, it, back to, I could be wrong, but backed by what? Full faith and credit of what? I mean, is this a, a rogue currency? What, what is this? It's funny to watch and we'll keep an eye on it on this program. All right, now to the selfie. You might have also heard, especially if you watch Fox TV, that the president and the prime minister of England and the prime minister of Denmark leaned into each other at the somber funeral of Nelson Mandela and they took a selfie. And there are people beating up the president and saying it just shows how insignificant he really is and that the British prime minister is his little puppy dog and he was flirting with the Denmark prime minister. Well, that's another issue. And if you've seen some of the photos, you'll notice this expression from Michelle, which stayed with us pretty much the whole time. That little marital thing going on there, I actually, for the first time in my life, I felt bad, I felt bad for Michelle. <laughs> I really did. Um, but I, I have to say this. I don't like this president. All right. I really despise this presidency. But him taking a selfie, a photograph of the three of them, I mean, c c cut him a break. R really? They were there for hours. And a lot of it was not somber. It was just fun, telling stories, laughing, dancing. Who knows how many people in that huge throng had been drinking. And they're just, they're having fun. I mean, that's what they were doing. And they took a picture. So I don't want to degenerate to being a partisan when it comes to politics, and neither should you. So it's like somebody goes in the voting booth and votes straight party line, no matter what. It's my party and I'm sticking with it. You know, I hate Obama no matter what he does, I hate it. He brushed his teeth this morning. What an idiot he is. Why did he brush his teeth? I mean, cut the man a break. Let's go after the president on issues of substance because that's what is wrong with this president. It's not that he took a selfie. It's that he is destroying liberty and justice. And he's an enemy of life and an enemy of marriage. That's the problem. And when we come back, we'll talk about how the Saudis don't like him. Yeah, I, I can't believe the stuff that they're saying. And cut. You see, Obama bowed down to that king. And this is the payback. Don't trust people that wear towels on their head. Do you want to have knowledge, wisdom, discernment? If so, you have to read good books, theology, history, books that look at the lives of great men and women. So to help you to become a more effective Christian, a better witness for truth, somebody who can engage in productive conversation that exhorts and edifies those that you speak with, we're gonna do something crazy. We're offering you these seven books for a gift of any size. You just pay for the shipping and handling and then give whatever gift that you can and we will send them to you. But just to make it a little bit more crazy, I will send you a second copy of my three books autographed. You can give them as a gift to your pastor or to a family member and help extend truth and justice in the world. This is While Supplies Last. George Washington said, I walk on untrodden ground. There is scarcely any part of my conduct which may not hereafter be brought into precedent. What would you think of a man who had his home and his business right here, okay? And then next to him was another man who had a home and a business. And this other guy made little widgets and parts for this guy. Okay? So they have a business relationship 
They're also neighbors. And this guy, guy number two, is abusing his children in ways that we won't discuss. And you can even hear the cries for help coming from the house. And the man over here, home one, business one, he hears the cries. And he says, it's none of my business. We have a business relationship. It's about my self-interests. Well, that's pretty disgusting. And that is the U.S. foreign policy. American interests. And that generally, loosely translated means our monetary interests and our ability to have ports and airfields and military bases around the world. That's what it means. In other words, we're the guy with the business and we know that the Saudis are the number one financier of, say, terrorism in the world. We know that they have a horrific uh, record of human rights. We know that the Chinese, which is our number one trading partner, we know that they have slave labor camps, that they forcefully kill babies every day with their one-child policy. And yet we say the business first. It's about money. It's about American interests. And that is why our foreign policy will one day come back to haunt us and it already is in some areas, but it's going to haunt us in this world and our leaders are going to give a fearful reckoning in the next life. A fearful reckoning. Because Jesus said, what you did to the least of these, you did to me. And the fact that we have abandoned, wholesale abandoned, the Christians in China, in Saudi Arabia, in Pakistan, that we try and have normal relations with people that regularly brutalize men, women, and children, this is a crime against God and man. So the Saud, there's a Saudi prince, all right, he's part of the royal family, and he used to be the head of their security apparatus. He's a former intelligence officer, I should say, and he mocked the president uh, in the New York Times. Very interesting article. He said, we've seen several red lines foot, put forward by President Obama, which went along and became pinkish as time grew. And eventually they ended up becoming completely white. And he's talking about Obama's saber rattling regarding Syria. The Saudis want an intervention there because Syria is the dog, the little puppy of Iran. And the Saudis don't like Iran because the Saudis are Sunnis and the Iranians are Shiites. So this prince is just outright mocking the president. And he also said, interestingly, he said that Israel and Saudi Arabia knew once when they saw that Obama did nothing to Assad after using all those chemical weapons on innocent men, women, and children. When, when, when Obama did nothing, said he was going to, and then backed off, they said, we knew at that point that Iran was going to get a nuclear weapon. The Saudis and Iran both knew, and Israel knew. Everyone knows, okay, we're, we're clear to proceed. That's worth hammering this president about. Oh, and by the way, just one last thing about Saudi Arabia. Very tragic, very sad. A man named Omar al Said was sentenced to 300 lashes and four years in prison because he publicly called for a constitutional monarchy, a constitutional democracy. And he criticized the government there for its human rights record. So, the Saudi Arabian government said, you criticize us for the human rights, we beat you 300 times! How do you even beat a man with a lash 300 times? They must do it on the installment plan. I mean, if you got hit 300 times with a lash, it would kill you. Your, your body would go into shock. So this guy's going to be in prison for four years, probably dishing out the 300 lashes as he goes, because he dared to say that the Saudi government should not abuse people. Does anyone besides me find that incredibly ironic? But don't worry, probably the next time that Obama meets with the head of the Saudis, he'll bow down to them. Do you want to get America out of the hands of wicked and unjust men and women who are destroying the Republic before our eyes? and put leadership back into the hands of righteous men and women so that we don't die as a nation? Well, you're talking about social revolution and there are rules in social revolution. 
We can look at the victorious social revolutions of the past, such as the end of slavery, the end of child labor, women's voting rights, the end of segregation, and so much more, and learn from their victories. Look at their actions, their images, their rhetoric, their sacrifices, and their final fruit. We will send you this series that originally cost $129, seven books for students, one teacher's guide, if you'll give a gift of any size and just pay for shipping and handling. Take advantage of it today. My wife and I, for five years, have been grinding our own wheat and baking our own bread from scratch. Within two hours, you can have fresh wheat in your hand and then piping hot bread come out of the oven. The most nutritious and delicious bread you will ever have. And we do it for under a dollar a loaf. Call Paula's Bread and find out about this grain mill and the mixer and how it can save you money and change your life. James Madison said, there is no maxim, in my opinion, which is more liable to be misapplied and which therefore needs more elucidation than the current, that the interest of the majority is the political standard of right and wrong. One of the greatest presents that you or I could give to our families during this Advent Christmas season not to mention a present that we could give to them every day of the year, is to be present. To be present to them. In other words, if we're on our device, got me, let me give out my device because I've got one, and we're sitting there going like this at the family dinner table or at the swim meet or, or let's whip out the computer and, or the photograph and just take a, a thousand photos. If, if we're present to our device, if we're present to cyberspace, it means that we're not present to the people in our presence. And interesting, a study from Ohio just came out and it showed that the more online use people had, the more they were using their devices or their computers, the more riddled with anxiety they were. Interesting. They literally found a direct correlation in a scientific study between people who use online devices a lot and how much anxiety they feel. They're not at peace. They're worked up. So it's a double blessing to put the thing down. It's a double blessing to step away from the computer. You have the gift of relationship and love and laughter with people and you're not riddled with anxiety. One other thing, they, uh, they did a study on adults who feels fatigue and what they found was that people that are around 65 or even older have less fatigue than people who are 18 to 24. Now, how counterintuitive is that? My question is, is there a connection to the cyber world? I mean, think about it. If you're riddled with anxiety, it depletes energy. You become fatigued. Remember that study we looked at a few weeks ago about the bedroom, the child's bedroom becoming a sanctuary, or rather being a, a room that brings stress and distress to them because they're taking their laptops and their iPads and their iPhones to bed. And they're using their room to play some of these horrific video games. The bedroom should be a place that's a sanctuary, a place of peace, a place of rest a place of maybe some meditation, some prayer. But it's become a source, the bedroom itself has become a source of anxiety because the cyber world has crept into it. I keep coming back to this over and over because I see the slow choking of the human soul with these things, with relationships. So. Be really careful, friend, what gifts you buy for your kids, what games you buy. It's, we're way better off playing Clue or a Monopoly game and being present to each other or Parcheesi than having a Wii on with this or one of these horrific games where they're killing people and blowing stuff up because of the convivial laughter and joking. I hope that you have a blessed Advent season and I hope that you give the present of your presence to those that you love.